critics of liberalism and enlightenment and so on, he wasn't promoters. And we talked about the critics this morning. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Perry Anderson, I'm sure he wasn't the only one, who made the point that sometimes in his fascination with the critics of the enlightenment, he came dangerously close to sounding too much like them. Well, yes, that's partly the ventriloquist thing that I was talking about. But yes, I remember once saying to a French friend of mine, uh, making the case that Isaiah Berlin was really uh, a defender of the Enlightenment. And uh, there's no question about it. But really what I just said, but there's this fascination with putting the Enlightenment to the test by seeing how it stands up to the And this French friend said to me, well, actually, he was rather fascinated by those things. And I think it's true. I think he was kind of drawn, in a way. It was kind of an intellectual adventure to see what it was like to be Joseph Gomez or Georges Sorel. Um, I think he did take pleasure in, in having dangerous thoughts. Mm. Yes. Look, I, I did notice, I thought it was fascinating that, uh, that video that Henry showed 
where he was talking about what a child asks, and he gave us the example of all these different meanings of can't, you know, um, is, is, is the sense in which you can't do this like the sense in which you can't do that, and he gave all those examples. That's pure J.L. Austin. I mean, um, uh, he was very much influenced. I mean, he was very much part of this world of um, what we used to call the linguistic philosophy. Um, and I would say Austin was a very major influence. Uh, he had a huge respect for John Austin's um, uh, way of doing philosophy, looking very closely at the way we use, we use words like can and, and so on. Um, I'm not sure that he was ever a close student of Wittgenstein. Um, I think he regarded himself, uh, and we know this from the biography, um, and, and it's very clear that he at some point decided that he wasn't going to do philosophy directly in this way at all. He just, he stopped doing philosophy in the late thirties and didn't really, he did write one or two articles about the time. Um, and he, I, I think he carried that conception of what philosophy is like with him uh, thereafter. He never really pursued, he didn't keep up with developments in modern political philosophy particularly. He did read Rawls, but wasn't particularly sympathetic um, to Rawls' systematic. I think, in light of what I said at the end of my uh, talk, he should have been more interested in Rawls than he was. Because Rawls, after all, was interested, the, the whole point of Rawls was to try to elaborate principles of justice that can be called upon from different conceptions, of, conception, different value positions, different conceptions of the group. You asked about G.E. Moore. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think he had any particular interest in Moore. I, he probably liked this kind of straightforward, commonsensical set of ideas, but I don't think Moore was any particular. You did want to tell me an anecdote saying George Moore once asked Lady Kinnard to take her clothes off. <laughs> she said, I will. She did. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could do the same kind of analysis in regard to Karl Popper. Uh, now, the same kind of analysis as what? <laughs> Oh, I see. I, I didn't quite catch the question. I don't know if everybody else the same kind of analysis with... Uh, just well, you would like to do the same kind of analysis in French mm -hmm. Karl Popper. Is that right? That was your question. Yeah. I mean, I, did, I, I used to talk to him about some of this, and I, 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 he wasn't that... To tell you the truth, he was rather... Um, this is something you don't really get from my good magic's book. He, he had a certain kind of... Um, what, do, I, do I dare say arrogance? Do I dare say that? A certain kind of, let's say, dismissiveness about contemporary uh, philosophers and uh, liberal thinkers, let's say, or, or uh, I mean, I, I, I think he didn't have a very high regard for Popper. He liked Popper's, as it were, um, not true. Not true. Not true. Although no. it's just not. Okay. Well, my impression was, uh, I mean, he, he liked Popper, Popper as a philosopher of science. I don't think he thought much of Popper as a political thinker. Not true. Really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll have that discussion. Um, but he, he liked the, he certainly agreed with Popper's um, anti utopians No, I'll tell you a story. I, I, I told him once that I used to go to Popper's seminar and have lunch before with Imre Lakatos. Mm. And then there was a fallout between Lakatos and Popper. Mm. And Lakatos stood up and said, let's go to the seminar on the open society by one of its worst enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and I told this story to Isaiah. He did like that. Yeah. No, he said, yeah. no, no, by no means. Oh. He said that, first of all, he said, Popper had immense influence on me. So oh. I said to him, and you think that the open society is just a pamphlet of, of the Cold War, I mean, of the war, he said. Well, he said, no, by no means. It's a great book, and it had immense influence. Hmm. Well, he said different things to me, but, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think maybe that reveals his uh, complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we'll use the microphones. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that, well, he's ready to admit that Machiavelli made a great uh, leap 
forward by, mm. by breaking down uh, out from the, from the monastery of history and, and uh, where we himself called him a dualist. Uh, but I guess my question is that, uh, well, if Machiavelli uh, made this uh, great progress, he seems to admit that uh, history is made by, by great men thinkers. And, and to follow up, uh, I mean, uh, my interest is uh, what do, what is his thoughts on original values? I mean, we, we all are ready to, 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 to see the idea of the kind of value plural, Mm, it's expressed, expressed very Could clearly. you speak up a bit? Yes, but uh, I mean, he didn't really answer the question of, of origin of values, and perhaps he could elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you asked a great question there. I mean, I think he did think that how we think, in other words, uh, our attitudes or our beliefs about uh, these sorts of questions are hugely important. I mean, as to the question of origins values, no, he didn't, he didn't discuss that. In fact, Max Weber has far more to say about those questions. But he did think that values, that, that, that conceptions of, of, of the world and how, how intellectuals think was, was terribly important. And that's why he, he was so um, uh, passionately committed to, uh, to, to trying to convert his readers and, and, and us students to to, to value pluralism, he thought, and, 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 and I think that in a way, his, his writings and his teaching were, were intended as a great warning to, especially his left-wing students, not to be seduced uh, by, um, you, you know, what he called monism, which, uh, of course, for him, largely meant uh, Marxism and, and uh, related, well, especially Marxism, uh, and. And so he believed that that that, that, um, that how we think about the world and values was, was a terribly important thing, and and somehow I think he thought that converting converting people to uh, to believing in persuading people to believe in value pluralism was going to be very important. Uh, I I wonder myself whether in fact it would you know if more people had believed what what he what he wanted us to believe, whether many of the disasters of the 20th century would be Chris. I thought you mentioned the message was terribly important about, about the essays, but it mm. seems to me that in some ways you could say that it was part of his interest, part of Isaiah's interest, to strengthen liberalism by studying yeah. the, the form of studies. And uh, none of the liberals have done this. I mean, the message was practically. Now, it was known as a name, but it was not really known uh, for, for what he'd written, what he'd lived in, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And it seemed to me that uh, one can interpret that uh, as, a, as a contribution uh, mm -hmm. to the history of liberalism uh, and to his weaknesses. Uh, secondly, uh, yes. the, I have to say that the combination of Weber and, and uh, Isaiah didn't uh, quite to me or make sense to me. Um, they were so different uh, in so many different ways. And also brought up, of course, the fact that they lived in two countries very, very differently. Uh, and whether Isaiah's for liberalism was not to a very large extent determined by the country he lived in. Uh, and just as a footnote on Weber, whom I beg your respect, uh, but I must say, not in connection with Isaiah. <laughs> and I was, in fact, wondering if there's any re any evidence uh, that I spent much time on my paper. Um, but the other thing I want to say was, you gave the impression that Weber, in that famous essay of his, and, and the disenchanted world, and the old gods might rise again, and so on and so forth, seemed to hope for charismatic leaders. <laughs> was, I'm here to say, I mean, my, my reading of the earlier Weber is that he saw precisely in Parliament and parliamentary uh, power, uh, the political pedagogy of future leaders. Uh, so if there's going to be similarity between Weber and, and Berlin, it would have to be an appreciation of Parliament. Hmm. That's so interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, first of all, what you said about the mess, yes, I mean, I, I tried to say this. It seemed to me, well, I tried to say both that he was trying to strengthen and defend liberalism by, by focusing on its most 
troubling critics. Right. And um, on the other hand, I did also add that I think he also, to some extent, enjoyed the adventure of, of thinking, of thinking, of, of, of getting inside their, their, their minds and trying to imagine what it would be like to be the best. I think he enjoyed that. But, but um, as to the second thing you say, I'm sorry I didn't persuade you about Weber. I mean, it seems to me that they, they were, I was struck by this, the fact that they were both very, um, that they shared at some level this belief that values can be reconciled, that there is this irreducible conflict between values. So I was, you're quite right, of course, they lived in different times and places, they were very different. So what I was trying to do, first of all, start from what looked like, looks like a very interesting parallel, but then to find out that they did end up in very different places. And, and the, the difference that I was trying to focus on was that, that um, I mean, you're right, they both had a, a belief in Parliament. The ISR has nothing to do, doesn't really say much about Parliament. He, he just took the took ground of parliamentary democracy. <laughs> so, so he just, I mean, it was obvious. Whereas Weber argued for it. But, but I think Weber did believe in, in and hope for, as you said, charismatic leaders. I don't think ISR ever did. say that Berlin probably would be very happy with seeing you thinking dangerously comparing him to, to Weber. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a challenge. I would even go farther than this and I would wonder if you if you can really think that uh, Berlin and Carl Schmidt, for example, uh, they recognize they recognize what I what i what I want to say, they recognize those sort of thinking values in the world. Yes. However the Schmidt draws a different conclusion than That's Berlin yes. about the choices that you make. Right. But I mean, what's, what's I think interesting in the comparison you made is that you have, well, two intellectual figures, one and second, well, disillusioned about the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, decept, not deceived that you can actually have all the values, but whether it seems to have a like, black and white picture and why Berlin is, is gray. And my question would be, do you think that in a way Berlin brought like liberalism back to the politics or politics back to liberalism? Because a lot of people consider liberalism as kind of like opposite towards the uh, towards the politics. It's like escape from the politics. And it seems that for, for Berlin, the, the choice is inevitable. Uh, it is, so, like a choice, political choice. Mm. Gosh, well, there's a lot there. I mean, I think, yes, you're mentioning Carl Schmidt. I mean, I, I, I wondered whether to mention Schmidt. I mean, Sch Schmidt, Carl Schmidt is kind of Weber massively radicalized and rendered extreme. I mean, for Schmidt, you had to make decisive choices, and they would be. The kind of decision that you made that, that would be radical and total. And so, Carl Schmidt, in a way, drew the ultimate conclusion that, that they didn't. That, you, you know, it wasn't a question of somehow, as, as Berlin ends up saying, uh, dealing with plurality by finding compromises and, 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 and uh, you know, respecting different values in, in, a, in a political context. For Schmidt, it was a question of making decisive choices and, and confronting and, and defeating values that you really <coughs> hold. And uh, in other words, it was a question of friend and enemy, and you couldn't be more, um, you couldn't take a position more different from Isaiah than that. One more question before we break. <laughs> I would like to raise a, a childish question, perhaps, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for a change, uh, not least due to the reason that it uh, refers to the notion of childhood or mm -hmm. infancy in the understanding of Isaiah Berlin. I was struck by a perhaps imaginary or coincidental parallel between two references of to childhood or infant infancy that I, uh, that I noticed. Uh, during your 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 uh, during the wonderful two wonderful presentations of this morning, a the understanding of basic philosophical questions, the matter of philosophical thinking, mm -hmm. as similar in some ways to questions being asked by mm -hmm. a child mm -hmm. by a child, mm -hmm. and b was uh, brought up by yourself uh, to the uh, understanding of longing for some kind of absolute values yes. and hierarchy and order of order of values yes. as a relic of childish longing for certain for yes. certainty yes. and degree of protection. Do you believe that those two references to childhood or, or 
uh, infancy belong, uh, refer to the same, uh, same uh, notion of infancy that was uh, common throughout Berlin's work, or perhaps he did not have a, a coherent concept of infancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what would a coherent concept of infancy be? I mean, I think as I would be the first to say that just as human beings are complex, multiple, and, and, and um, you know, divided into all kinds of um, inc incompatible things, uh, so are children. And um, no, I don't think he had a theory of character, just as I don't think he really had a theory of liberalism. Oh, that note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>